and thank you for being here for tonight's third annual Break the Silence Speaker Series, the virtual edition. I just want to thank you all so much for being willing to be flexible and for understanding um, as somebody who loves hugs and touch, and I would just absolutely love to be in the presence of all of you all. So thank you for your flexibility, and we look forward to being together again in the future. So I uh, just want to invite you, if you are needing to step away from the camera at any point, um, if you've got, if you get Zoom fatigue or anything like that, just take care of yourself and know that, um, you know, you can take a break and you can come back. Uh, also, if you feel at any point that you're uh, need, in need of emotional support and you needed to talk to someone, we would encourage you to call our 24-hour crisis hotline. So we are here tonight as advocates in the fight to end sexual violence and to celebrate the important work of this organization, Our Voice, as well as our featured speaker tonight, who I am delighted to have. Sexual violence, human trafficking, and sexual harassment affects all people. It is woven into the thread of our society and no one um, is not affected by it. It impacts women, men, non-gender conforming identities, children and elders, and our community is not an exception. We're here tonight to support all people, whether it happened to you or someone you love. We are here to break the silence and we are here to say, you are not alone. My name is Marisol Colette, and I am the president of our board of directors. And I stepped into this role as a leader on the board just about five years ago, because I believe in the vital role that our voice plays, not only in supporting survivors on their healing journey, but in the work of preventing sexual violence from happening in the first place. It is near and dear to my heart. It has felt like a calling for a long time and I'm so honored to be here in this position. Our Voice is our county's rape crisis center, responding to 24-7 to survivors in crisis in our community. We offer free individual counseling, and we stand as advocates as individuals navigate the criminal justice system. But Our Voice is also a leader in preventing this violence from happening in the first place. And the impact of the work at Our Voice is felt nationwide. Did you know that Our Voice offers education on sexual violence prevention in schools across WNC, Western North Carolina? Last year, Our Voice reached 3,277 middle school stu students going to their classrooms to talk about the impacts of bullying, to talk about healthy boundaries, and to promote respect. Our Voice also educated 772 high school students in Asheville and Buncombe County, leading conversations about healthy relationships, healthy dating, and consent. These conversations with youth are essential to building community that is free from sexual violence. And through our work, we see the attitudes and social norms that contribute to sexual violence are actually shifting. In the past year, we experienced a dramatic increase in calls from youth asking for prevention programming in their schools because they understand that learning about consent is a life skill that is needed in many aspects of their life. So grateful for this paradigm shift. Even in this time of COVID-19, our doors remain open. Please know that. Our counseling has moved to virtual sessions and we continue to support survivors. Isolation is a huge issue in this, in this, in supporting survivors. And so it is important and vital that we continue to do the work. And I'm so grateful that our staff and our board continue to show up every single day to support survivors. This work is hard, this work is powerful, this work is essential. And this work is possible because each and every one of you are here with us tonight, supporting us as allies, providing financial support, and cheering us on 
as we do this difficult work. You are furthering the anti-sexual violence movement right here in Asheville and in Western North Carolina by gathering to rally in support of our voice and in support of all survivors. So thank you. You are furthering this work by saying, y'all, time's up. In the spirit of tonight's event, I wanna share a small quote from a New York Times opinion piece written by Amber Tamlin in 2017, where she wrote, we are learning that the more we open our mouths, the more we become a choir. And the more we are a choir, the more the tune is forced to change. That's right, time's up. As board president, I'm honored to be a part of this event where we work to break the silence and to speak up, where we capture the energy of this movement on a national level bringing it home to our community, to our city, and to our efforts to support survivors and prevent violence in our mountain home. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Blessings. Hi, I'm Carolyn Curtis, a member of the Board of Directors for Our Voice. Welcome. Our Voice was founded over 45 years ago, making it one of North Carolina's oldest rape crisis centers. Our beginnings were humble and for the first years, volunteer support was vital for our existence and service provision until we were able to hire our first part-time executive director in 1981. While we now have grown to a staff of 20, our volunteer support remains just as vital as ever. We could not fulfill our mission without them. Tonight, I am excited to recognize the first recipients of our Yolanda Parker Service Award. Yolanda Parker is a former board member and volunteer extraordinaire. She gave hours to our voice with one goal, ensuring survivors had access to trauma-informed services that allowed them to rediscover their voice and their power to heal. It is with great honor that we recognize Lynn Weeks Karajinas and Betsy White, two remarkable volunteers that have given so much of their time, expertise, and enthusiasm to Our Voice. So much so that they might as well be considered Our Voice staff. Lynn and Betsy, thank you for your service and commitment to creating communities free of sexual violence. Your support continues to be vital. Two notes about our online venue. First, I want to point your attention to the donate button at the bottom right part of your screen. Much like volunteer support helps us fulfill our mission, financial support continues to be vital. Your donation makes an impact. Second, please be sure to check the digital program book for a message from our director, information about our services, details about our generous sponsors, Amber Tamblin's biography, and more by clicking the teal button in the center bottom of your screen. And now I have the privilege to introduce our featured speaker, Amber Tamblin, to the virtual stage. Amber Tamblin is an Emmy and Golden Globe nominated actor, writer, and director. She's the author of five books, including the critically acclaimed bestseller, Era of Ignition, Coming of Age in a Time of Rage and Revolution. You can get your copy. She's a contributing writer for the New York Times and a founding member of the Times Up organization. Amber Tamblin is an activist whose passion and dedication propels this work forward. Please join me in welcoming her to the stage where she will give her remarks and shortly thereafter, we will engage in a question and answer session. Amber Tamlin, the mic is yours. Ah, those words, the finest words I've ever heard. Uh, first of all, everyone, thank you so much. It's nice to virtually see you. I'm so sorry we didn't get to see each other um, back in, I think it was March at this point. Um, I'll let you all know that I actually did, I told the, um, 
I told the folks here from the organization, but I actually did have COVID-19. I had the virus. So I'm very happy I did not come see you. I'm sad I didn't come see you, but I'm very happy I didn't come see you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about why we're here this evening. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you know, every 98 seconds, uh, somebody in the U.S. is sexually assaulted. That means every single day, more than 570 people experience sexual violence in this country. That's a lot, every 98 seconds. Sexual violence permeates our culture, and we often see perpetrators walk free while organizers, activists, and survivors are left to pick up the pieces and try to assemble some form of justice. We see that every single day. All we need to do is look at some of the statistics to see how severe the problem it is and how sexual violence of all kinds is the underpinning of every major problem in the world. Because we know that where we find pervasive sexual assault and harassment from our boardrooms to our bedrooms, we ultimately find an imbalance of power. And that is what this is about. That is what this has always been about. Did you know that close to 18 million women have been estimated to have been the victims of rape since 1998? 18 million women. And 99% of perpetrators still end up walking free. 13% of female rape survivors will attempt to take their lives at some point, and 67% of trans people will experience sexual assault in their lifetimes. That is a staggering statistic, and it breaks my heart. The total amount of money that rape costs victims every year in the US, which even excludes child sexual abuse, is estimated at $127 billion. That's every single year. This is money spent on mental health, legal bills, medical bills, you name it. Girls who are ages 16 to 19 are four times more likely than the general population to be victims of rape, attempted rape or sexual assault. Female college students ages 18 to 24 are three times more likely than women in the general population to experience sexual violence. In fact, one in six American women have survived an attempted or completed rape in their lifetimes. The statistics, the statistics go on and on. I mean, I don't need to tell you, I'm sure many of you already know. This is why the work, the work that our voice has been doing since 1974 is so incredibly important and perhaps, perhaps more urgent and needed than ever before. Our voice understands the impact of sexual violence on the futures of our women and our communities and the incredible importance of providing safe emotional and physical space to grieve, to heal, and speak your truth as a survivor. They understand that sexual assault is a pipeline to women's invisibility and erasure from larger forms of power. So often there is nowhere for a survivor of sexual assault to turn and find not only criminal justice, but spiritual justice, emotional justice. We leave women to psychologically fend for themselves. And in doing so, we have created a world which is largely numb to the statistics and the world that we that I just told you about. So now more than ever, I truly believe we have to fight for organizations that are protecting and supporting survivors of sexual assault. In the same way we fight to change laws that harm us or champion a political candidate we believe in or protest an injustice to make our voices heard. I know we all feel very, very stretched thin during these difficult times, and more often than not, we aren't sure where to put our energy or money or time. There are so many places. I get that. But you, you in North Carolina and the surrounding areas and anyone associated with our voice, you, you are lucky. You have one of the most extraordinary organizations right there in your backyard in Asheville. You've got it right there. So many places don't even have that. An organization that is there to hold that space for you and your communities, for your daughters, for your mothers, your friends, your wives, your partners. You have a voice. You have our voice. And I'd like to give a very special shout out 
to everyone who has poured their heart and soul into this organization, their, their guts into this organization. Marisol, you are an extraordinary woman. I'm super into your earrings. Didn't get to say that to you before, so I'm saying it now. And thank you to all the volunteers. Thank you also, uh, a big shout out to the sponsors who made our voice break the silent speaker series possible, especially Symmetry Financial Group. By the way, nobody asked me to say that. I asked them and I said, who has supported you the most? Who has given to you and been a real ally and person who, and an organization that has um, been there for you, tried and true? And that's what they told me. Because I think it's always important to say the names, say the organizations, all of those of us and the organizations and the companies that um, put their, their money where their mouth is. So thank you for doing that. Um, before uh, I open it up to questions, um, which I'd love to talk to all of you, anything you want to ask, anything you want to talk about, I'm here for you tonight. Uh, I wanted to, to read a poem. Um, this is a brand new poem that I wrote with Mahogany L. Brown. She's an extraordinary poet here living in Brooklyn. Um, we worked on this. We only just recently finished it, so it's super brand new. It's never been read anywhere. No one has ever seen it. Y'all are the first ones to see it and hear it. And I cannot think of a better audience to read it to. It's called, Of Those Who Love You. Against the weight of pride, the anchor of invisible shame, we will wait for you to call us by name, one by one. Today, may you list all the loves that love you, even when the chapel inside your throat becomes a sound only meant for you to hear. We hear you. And we are here, the champions of your bravery's bell, even when all you can ring out is a quiet truth in the space between your temples. We will carry the gift of you, the light of your choir, even if the song is too tender to unlock, even if your voice is not yet ready to be held. If all you have is the strength to hold the relief of silence, if all you feel is the trust of the air of the room and how you prepare for its rise in temperature, or maybe, or maybe you only believe in what you can build with your hands, the glorious creation you stir and bake or brew, the songs you careen from the safest part of your marrow, we will wait there, we will wait there for you. So call us in, by name, by body, by bone, one by one. We will reach through wind, through screen, through walls to tell you we are here. We will always be here. This love that loves you will never disappear. This love that loves you is gathered around the safety of your story until you're ready to speak its name. One by one, this love that loves you will never ask for what you are not ready to give. Even when you are in doubt, symbol snare colors the roots of your journeys, praying for the right answer a pulse towards freedom a way out we are here see our palms opened in your name search the lines in our hands outstretched and wide with this love that loves you, you an offering unowed call upon us one by one by one by one until we are an echo of each other's shelter, unbroken and bound. Thank you. Um, let's all take a collective deep breath. And we're going to, um, I'm now gonna open it up with some questions. Uh, Anything you guys want to talk about and we're going to move to the Q&A. Thank you so much, Amber. So we're taking questions and if you have a question, you can pick 
uh, go to the bottom of your screen to the ask a question. And I'm gonna start us off, Amber, just as everybody's queuing up. Yep. Um, and thank you so much for that poem, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. You. I was gonna ask um, how the Time's Up organization has been impacted during this time. I know that you're a global ambassador on the board and I'm just curious how that work has been impacted during this coronavirus moment. Well, it's it's impacted it in two ways. Um, one, it's impacted it because we can't meet in person, which as we all know is um, such an important, valuable part of uh, community building. And um, I think creating ideas of how to change not only uh, culture around sexual assault and harassment, but also the laws, um, the governments around that. So that's been a little bit more difficult. Um, I also think that because there's so much attention on the current pandemic as there should be, some of the attention has been taken off of the conversation that's been dominating the last two years, specifically since 2017's Me Too uh, movement. So um, those things are difficult, but we're constantly here. And I think on also on June 11th, I believe, it should be announced soon, but I'm doing a uh, in conversation on my Instagram live page with um, Time's Up CEO, Tina Chen, which everyone should tune into. That'll be really great. And we'll be talking a lot about uh, what the organization is doing right now. Um, but, you know, it's not something that is pausable, uh, meaning you can't put a pause on it. Uh, it you cannot uh, stop the work from happening. So we continue to, to push forward and um, do everything we can to talk about the ways in which we are trying to um, change the larger problems uh, that create an atmosphere and an environment where sexual harassment and assault permeates. Um, and that has so much to do with changing the rules of corporations, uh, the laws of the country, um, really getting to the root of the issue um, so, that it, so that we are stopping sexual assault and harassment before it even becomes an issue. That's the ultimate goal. Hands up organization, which you just asked, or answered, <laughs> but it started in Hollywood and then you have all these new initiatives. Can you talk a little bit about that? So Time's Up was born out of the idea, um, you know, and a lot, there, a lot of people always ask about, uh, you know, they ask about what's the difference between Time's Up and Me Too. Um, so I'd like to say that for anyone who's listening because I know that that's a common question. Um, what I'll say is that, um, Time's Up was created so that no woman, man, or non-binary person, or child, anybody, would ever have to say Me Too again. Me Too is a movement, an extraordinary movement created by Tirana Burke um, far before 2017, as 2017 sort of sh showed a, a new light on it. Um, it has now become an organization, but for the most part, it was a way in which um, survivors could share their stories. Uh, surrounding sexual assault and violence. And Time's Up is an organization that is pr primarily, our aim is to go into the workplace and stop sexual harassment uh, and sexual assault from a workplace standpoint, um, which includes changing the laws and the parameters around the way in which um, those things become possible in the first place. Uh, one of the biggest things I learned uh, from my whole experience the last two years um, being a founder of Time's Up and, uh, you know, learning so much from the lawyers and, and all of the incredible women who've given their hearts and souls to the organization is that something even as simple as changing the power balance within any given industry. Um, so even if you are, for instance, if you have a boardroom that is more representative um, and more equal, uh, then sexual harassment claims and sexual assault claims go down. So if there are more women in the room, uh, there is less violence. That is a statistical fact. So we aim to, to do that. We aim to kind of uh, do everything we can from all the different angles to change change the petri dish of, of sexual assault and harassment so that it is not just that, that it is much larger and we can change the way in which people are viewing women. Because ultimately, as I sort of said in my opening piece, that this is about power. It is not a struggle for power. And when we have more women represented, uh, oftentimes we see those things shift. So we talk about, um, we talk about inequality of, uh, 
you know, not only in the workplace, but we also talk about pay inequality. Uh, women are often paid far less uh, than their ma male uh, counterparts and women of color are paid a fraction of what white women are paid. Um, we see this trickle down effect constantly across industries. Um, and yes, Time's Up was formed initially with women in Hollywood, not just actresses. There were agents, there were assistants to agents, there were camera operators, there were producers. It was women of all different walks of life coming together with a common cause and saying, something has to change. We're not gonna ask for permission anymore. We're not gonna wait to ask for permission. We're just gonna do it. And frankly, that was, I can speak for our business, that was their worst nightmare that women were getting together in a room and talking. Uh, women who normally had been pitted against each other had been told, you know, not to, you know, you guys are in competition, you're not allies. That was that was Hollywood's worst nightmare and it came true. Um, and from that was born Time's Up. From that was born this organization, which has said, we now are taking a hold of the conversation and we're not asking you what we want, we're telling you what we want. And we, and you need to come along because this is the way that the, the country is changing. And this is the way that we wanna see things going forward. So um, our work was really born of that. And, and we specifically look at um, uh, businesses. That's one of the big things and laws. Uh, an amazing thing we did here recently in New York is we changed um, uh, with, uh, with the leadership of Robbie Kaplan, who's the co-founder of the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund. So for those who don't know, when Time's Up was formed, it was very important that we all said we didn't just want this to be an idea. We didn't want this to be a declaration. It had to be tied to an action. So the action was the forming of the Times Up Legal Defense Fund, which is a um, a, def a fund that is uh, used to help support uh, and bring justice for for anybody um, with claims of sexual assault or uh, harassment in the workplace. So it helps to, to funnel and pay for their legal fees. And it is a network of lawyers and survivors and, and all kinds of different people. So Robbie Kaplan, um, who co-founded that, uh, worked very hard to change the statutes of limitations here in New York, which was huge. We were, I, I don't remember the exact um, year count, but I think it was something like four years. It was really terrifying. Like you had to, you know, press charges within four years of being sexually assaulted or harassed. Otherwise, it didn't matter anymore. So we changed that. We almost tripled um, the amount of years that someone is able to um, to, to get that claim. So that's a huge, you know, that's a small step, but in the bigger picture, it's a really big piece of change that we've needed um, in this state. And we, we want to continue doing things like that throughout the country. Thank you for just talking us through that primer and the legal work and just how that organization has grown. So we've got lots of questions coming in. This one is, what is one thing we can all do in our daily lives to dismantle rape culture and combat the pervasiveness of sexual harassment and violence? Great question. Um, that's hard. <laughs> it's very hard to do. I think that each of us has to have some kind of, um, we have to push against, uh, the stigmas that have been put in place and we have to push against uh, the ways in which we've been told to think and behave. And that includes um, our own misogyny towards other women. I think that's one of the biggest, most unmined conversations um, yet to be had is about um, our own self-hatred and hatred towards other women. We've been taught that. Um, we've been taught to be competitive as a culture, uh, women against women. That includes um, cis women against trans women. That includes white women against black women. Um, we have been taught that. We have been taught that there's only this much space for all of us to thrive. Um, and we've been, we've been given that as an option. And so we end, up, uh, we end up harming each other because of that. And I think that rape culture is directly affected by that. So one of the biggest ways I would say to combat it is to reach out to women in your community, women you may not know, women you may not necessarily have anything in common with and try to find um, a way to come together over a common cause. I think that's a very, very important aspect of all of this. 
is that it's not just about um, the patriarchy and, and patriarchal narratives and uh, an oppressive mass from that side. We are also um, inter interpersonally, uh, you know, pushing down on our own um, ability to, to grow beyond rape culture and to help sort of cure it from the inside out. So one of the things I always talk about is that is this idea of, uh, of interconnectedness between different kinds of women, women who are not like you, women who come from different backgrounds, different socioeconomical backgrounds, different races, different experiences, um, different journeys, and to try to connect. Because I feel like if we can grow a stronger coalition amongst women, um, and that includes sometimes, you know, this is the whole larger conversation of, of white women reaching out to, um, you know, white liberal women reaching out to more white conservative women. Um, I think we, we owe it to ourselves to dig deeper and to hold space for each other so that there is um, not, there's, there's less space for the bad forces to come in and pit us against each other, which creates the space for those types of violences to happen. That's, so that's a small part of it. And I think something that we can control. Other parts, of it, it, you know, I can give you a, a list a mile long of the bad ways in which rape culture has permeated, but not a lot of that we can control. What we can control is our relationship to other people and certainly our relationship to women, including holding them up and supporting them. So well said. And before we end tonight, we're gonna give everyone a little homework that relates to that. So perfect. Great. More questions. Okay. How do you suggest we support and empower the youth in our lives when they see so many in power disregarding their voices? Oh, yeah. um, it's hard. I have a, I have a three and a half year old daughter. Um, I'm constantly terrified for her in the future. Um, you know, I would hope I was pregnant with her in 2016. I was hoping for a different outcome. I personally was hoping for the first woman president. I thought that'd be pretty cool to have a daughter in that time. Um, instead, I got the opposite. And I have sort of chosen, as everyone else has, I've sort of chosen to see that less as a doomed fate and more of a lesson, a teaching lesson, which is that I haven't done enough um, I haven't dug deep enough. I haven't um, tried hard enough. And that was true at that time. Uh, you know, that was something that propelled me um, and sort of sort of weaponized me against the part of myself that hadn't done the more difficult work of having these types of conversations and putting myself and my career and my name on the line in order to change the world around us. You know, it was literally the year after the current president was elected that Me Too happened and Time's Up was formed. It was very, you know, it was very quickly after that. And so, um, so for me, when we talk about young girls and we talk about that, um, I think it's so important that our messaging is really strategic and that we are not afraid to have, to, to bring these conversations into the fold um, early on when they're young. I talk a lot about this in Era of Ignition in my book about not being able to protect women and our girls um, from sexual assault and harassment, um, you know, from the inequalities that we've been given and we've been passed down and which have been sort of seen as the norm for generations of women before us, for our mothers, for our grandmothers, um, and how to not do that so that it's not just about um, having conversations about protecting your own body and having bodily autonomy and being able to make your own choices about what you want to do with your body. Um, but it's also, it's also about destigmatizing young girls' ambition. I think this is a really important part of the puzzle because I also think ambition is tied to, um, is incorrectly tied to uh, the ways in which girls and women are sexually assaulted and harassed because we've been trained to believe that the way to get to get up in the world is um, a lot of times is to be the object of desire in the room. Um, so I think talking of, talking to our girls young, as young as we feel appropriate about that. Um, you know, there was a story my friend told me recently about being at the airport and 
her daughter was going her I think her daughter was like four or five years old was going through the um the TSA checkpoint and the TSA agent um as she was walking through put his hand up and said you can only come through if you give me a hug so of course she gave him a hug and my my mom friend of course was like you know she's a writer for the New York Times she's a feminist and that was probably the wrong daughter of a New York Times writing feminist to do that to because she gave him a good talking to about boundaries um, and also about the idea of telling a young girl that she can't do something unless she gives you something. Um, to which I've had some arguments with some men about that actually, who think that that's way too far and ridiculous, but they don't walk in our shoes. They don't live our lives. They don't see what we see every day. So that's on us. That's our responsibility to hold that line. You know, meanwhile, the TSA agent probably would have never, ever asked a little boy for a hug. Maybe he would have asked for a high five, something else likely, but who knows? So I think it's important for us to be able to speak to something when it's not right for our kids and for our girls um, and to just make sure that they know um, they know that their body is their own and that they're you know allowed to say no when they need to. Yeah. So while we're on the topic of men, <laughs> we have a question about your thoughts on how men can become partners in the struggle for equality, specifically how cis men begin those conversations with other men. Yeah. <laughs> um, so as we all know, this work is literally not possible without men. We need them. Um, we cannot we cannot do any of it without them. We need more allies. Um, you know, feminism is for everybody, the old bell hooks quote, and that's true. And it must be for everyone. We must understand that the idea behind it is that we ultimately want, we want women to be seen as equal. And that includes our bodies, not just our ideas. We want there to be a sense of equality that when men see us who are not our husbands, or sometimes even that are our husbands, that we are not, we're not an object. Uh, we're not something that is claimable, that is ownable, um, that is abusable. And that's the ultimate goal um, of feminism. And so for men, I think they are an integral part of the conversation. Um, I don't I'm not, I don't get down with anyone who dismisses them. I mean, I'm like the biggest writer of you know, problems of men. Um, but I think that, that is an important part of it uh, is that we look introspectively and we and we examine ourselves and we come to terms with um, with the ways in which we have been problematic. Um, and I think men could really benefit from being more introspective in that way. Again, in Era of Ignition, um, I have a chapter called A Male Ally Manifesto, and it's an entire list for men to, for, for ways in which men to feel like they can be a part of the change. Um, and oftentimes, you know, I know this coming from a place of, of a woman who is white and a feminist, that oftentimes you feel like the best way for you to participate or to be a part of a movement or change things is to lead the charge. And that's not right. That's actually not always the best way to do it. Um, I think deferment is really powerful. I think standing back and letting the people who are directly affected by any given conversation be the ones who lead the charge and you amplify them, you support them. Um, so in that same way, I think a lot of the times men are often the ones who are trying to dictate what the consequences should be for behavior. Men are the ones in the past who have been the ones to say, this isn't right. It's too much. It's gone too far. It's a witch hunt, you know, fill in the blank, which we heard plenty of after 2017's um, Me Too movement and the inception of Time's Up. But to them, I kind of say you don't really get to decide because the conversation doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me, but it doesn't belong to you either. And what we're having now is a discourse. We're having a conversation and it's really hard. It's a really hard conversation. And I know it hurts to watch people that you love, whether that's actors or comedians or whoever, uh, you know, fall from grace because of that conversation. But that is part of the process of figuring out what the new rules are. And we have to find we have to find out what those new rules are. So one of the things I offer in that chapter um, specifically are just simple ways for men to um, 
to do that because I know that there is a, there is a real fear of like, I, I'm, I can't hug in the workplace anymore. I can't do all of these things that I'm used to. I want to help, but I feel like every time I help, I just hurt, I harm. Every single one in this chat, in this conversation at this event right now, uh, has a father, a husband, a brother, has somebody they've been having this argument with. That is a fact. There's not one of you that doesn't have that. Somebody in the extended family, whatever it is. And that's okay. And that's, you know, part of it is is sort of getting them hip to the idea of what we need. Um, so I would encourage anyone who has the book or is getting the book to take a look at that long manifesto. It's pretty great. Yeah, it is a great part of the book. I enjoyed that part. Okay, we have another question, and this is about Harvey Weinstein. What shift have you seen in the entertainment industry since his conviction? I've seen a lot of shifts. Well, since his conviction, well, okay, since his conviction, I would say, you know, there are things that I think people took for granted before. Um, or thought were not important or thought women certainly thought they were not deserving of um, that are now sort of in place to protect us. Um, there's been a lot to be made fun of the idea of intimacy coordinators. I've seen that constantly and people think it's a joke, but as someone who's appeared in, you know, 50 plus movies, who's been working since she was 11 years old, I'm 37 now. So do the math. Um, I've done a lot of sex scenes and, and, more times than not, they're incredibly uncomfortable and incredibly unprofessional and leave you feeling kind of sick to your stomach. And it doesn't have to be that way. It's usually not that way in theater, um, at least in my experience. But I think in uh, a lot of times in film, film and television, there is a blurred line. So I've seen some change in that regard in the idea of taking what women might need seriously. And if you don't, there are repercussions for that. In general, I have seen, I think one of the biggest things we've we've seen, the biggest changes we've seen is the um, overwhelming uh, demand for pieces of work um, produced, directed, uh, written by women. That's a huge deal. I mean, the numbers were so staggeringly sad before 2017. It was like less, I think I was part of a documentary called The 4% which was about the four, annually, there are only 4% of women direct the top grossing films. Um, and I think it was less than 1% of those women were women of color. That's all the movies you see all year. That's like over a hundred films, two of them are directed by women. It's unacceptable. Zero of them are directed by trans women. Maybe one is directed by a woman of color. It's, it's, the dis it's so disproportionate and it's so not representative of the country and the world we live in. Um, you're not having the voices there that are telling the stories that represent all of America. You're just showing a fraction of that. So I would say one of the biggest changes, you know, you know uh, is probably uh, is that, probably is the that. fact that we are seeing a lot more content by women. Um, and that's the way that it should be. And we should see more and more and more of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a director friend who was just talk, talking about intimacy direction and work. So it's an awesome thing that she was talking about. You know, you can now have a conversation about, um, you know, does this woman need to do this scene or what's really, you know, is this really important? And so it's great to it's have really so allies on set. It's so fascinating to me, right? Because we've always in the in the film industry, we've always had fight coordinators. That's, you don't do a fight scene without a fight coordinator. They come in, they tell you like, here's how you're gonna punch, here's how you fake pull someone's hair, here's how you do these things. And yet we have never given that um, courtesy to women. It's just like whatever happens organically in the moment. Um, and I think also, honestly, if I'm being really honest, I think men really appreciate it. I don't think it's comfortable for them either. And mm. once you have the parameters set, once you can say, please don't put your tongue in my mouth, please, you know, if you can agree on, can you touch my breasts? Can you touch my butt? Can you, how should we touch? At what point does it get more physical? You have that conversation. Then when you do it, 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 it's in the back of your mind so you can be more free in the moment. Um, 
you know, I think I wanted to express that to people because it's hard to think about what an intimacy coordinator is, but truly it's just kind of laying the groundwork of what everyone is comfortable with, men and women, anybody that is part of a scene. And we do that for fight scenes, so we should do that for sex scenes as well. Yeah, yeah. that's a great that's way great. to practice consent. <laughs> yes, 100%. Okay, more questions. I want to get to everybody's as best we can. Um, I'll try to get to the answers. <laughs> yes. <great. laughs> okay, so Christy is asking, what advice do you have for young women that are struggling to find the balance between being too trusting and too skeptical of people? Girls who want to take risks and live life to the fullest without putting themselves in risky situations. Oh, it's such a good question. It is very hard to not put yourself in a risky position. I'm... I, you know, I've been married for seven years and have a three-year-old and I still am in a risky position constantly. Like that is life for women. So I think to a certain degree, we can't, um, we have to really focus, I think, on making good choices within those risks, um, figuring out ways to do it uh, so that we can protect ourselves. I think arming young women with information is the most powerful tool that we have because we can't control the world around us, right? We, there's nothing we can really do about that, but we can arm ourselves and our teenage girls, our young girls with information. Um, and we have to also come to terms with the fact that something probably will happen at some point for a long time um, to our young girls. At some point in their life, they will experience uh, something that is really painful and difficult. And I think the more we as parents or as teachers or as friends can also figure out how we're going to respond to that as opposed to laying it all on uh, young women who wanna take risks, um, it's important that we are able to help uh, when they're in that moment, um, help them figure out a way to heal from it and to move forward. Um, that is, I think, so important so that it's not, the work is not always on uh, young girls, but also on the teachers and the people, um, the people around them, parents, um, guardians. And to that end, I think also the work is, um, is very much on those of us who have sons, um, fathers who have sons. These are conversations that need to happen, whether your son is very young or whether your son is a grown adult. Uh, there is always a right time to talk about how to behave, how to treat somebody else. So um, I think that it's a sort of two pronged approach, um, less emphasis on, I think, give information, give a, give a good education to young girls. But also we have to be good mentors and teachers. We have to be good responders and we have to teach men. We have to teach boys the right way to behave. Yeah. yeah. Information is power. power. Okay, okay, Laura, your question. Um, the incredible strive. Okay, so the incredible strides I've witnessed in our voice uh, group is more remarkable than any tele television I've ever viewed. Wondering if you think it would be possible to create a series for film which focuses on recovery of survivors of sexual trauma and violence. It's so funny you say that. Um, <laughs> I'm actually working on that right now. Awesome. <laughs> Can you say anything more or is it? Yeah, it's a big, a big, it's something big, but I can't say anything, unfortunately. Yeah. But it's you're good right to know on. that they're, you're right on, you're spot on. And I think so much of the time we, um, we glamorize the hunt for a predator. Uh, we glamorize, um, you know, the way detectives work, the way lawmakers work. Uh, we look at everything other than the stories the, the humanizing of the stories of not only um, survivors of sexual assault, but everything they go through after the assault, which is like a secondary assault, being not believed, being told you're a liar, being told, um, you know, this person will never, you'll never see justice, um, you know, being ostracized from your community, not being believed by parents, by family. Um, you know, the, the assault is almost never ending. So um, I'm with you. And I think that that is uh, where we are very, very due um, in our industry for telling a really good story about perseverance and the beauty of grief. Yeah. Oh, and I see Cynthia's comment. She's talking about Unbelievable is a great show on Netflix. I watched that one too. It was a wonderful, oh, cool. I don't know Please. if you've seen that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, 
this is a question from Gabriella. Um, so Amber, as part of the Time's Up movement, you're familiar with the obstacles that a community as a society we need to face to create a cultural change. So she's asking specifically about Asheville. Asheville is a progressive community in some ways, but more work is needed to send the message across our community. What can we do to support our voice to continue to deliver that message across our community? Well, I think in any organization, um, you know, if you can't give money, if you if I, if financially you can't give, even though I would encourage everybody here tonight, I don't know how many people are watching, but even if everybody gave five bucks at the end of the night or 10 bucks, that would still be a nice donation amongst all of us. Um, so consider that. But if, if, if that is something you can't do, then um, then I would suggest volunteering. I think I think volunteering goes much further than most people realize. Um, we are always any of us always in need. Even times up, we're constantly asking people, "Do you want to join? Do you want to be a part of it?" You know, someone will say, "That's that's how um, uh, times up healthcare uh, came about." Was there was two women, two doctors, um, Esther Chu and this other doctor, and they said, "We are seeing." A staggering disproportion, not only in, uh, you know, in the boardrooms of hospitals, um, but also in research. There aren't enough women in research to sort of look at the different diseases that predominantly affect women, to look at why Black women are overwhelmingly affected by heart disease and diabetes and, you know, and the, the, the mother mortality rate. We don't have enough women to sort of be there to be a part of those conversations. And, and Time's Up response to them was, great, let's do it. Let's start Time's Up Healthcare. You guys run it. The beauty of the organization is that it's kind of like a moving organism. And you suddenly have two people that, are, that have found a blind spot and have said, oh, this is missing. We're not having this conversation about women in advertising, um, you know, women school teachers, um, you know, women in healthcare, like whatever that is. Somebody sees the blind spot and Time's Up says, great. Let's create it around you and we will amplify it. Um, and that's been some of the great work that it, that for actresses and women of, of influence in my position is to be able to take, you know, the brilliant work of all the lawyers like Robbie Kaplan, who I mentioned, and Hillary Rosen and amplify it and say, I'm here to be a, a board to help, you know, bring it to bring it to light and bring it to attention. So to answer your question anyway, um, I think volunteering, I think being someone that helps spread the message is really, really important. It may not feel like it's a big deal, but it is a big deal. The outreach part of, uh, of any organization's work is hugely important and, and mightily effective if we all pitch in a little bit. Yes, thank you. I'm going to give a plug for our voice and say too that, you know, I'm a board member, I'm a supporter. Um, so we have this wonderful organization in our community. So again, whether it's donation support or volunteering with us or joining our board, um, it's been a wonderful thing for me personally, because I felt so helpless to some of these issues. And then suddenly you're on the board and here I am doing a Q&A and helping um, in all kinds of ways throughout the community. So um, that's exactly. another way to go. Exactly. Okay, so we have just a few more minutes for questions. I'm going to go by vote. So if you have a question you really want, <laughs> you can click the arrow and vote for it. Um, I see we have one here. Um, from Roberta, she's asking how, oh, it just went away. Hold on, it's right up here. How do we approach the Tara Reid situation? Do you have any thoughts about that? I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, that's a really painful conversation. Um, I have no doubt she's telling the truth. Um, for me, you know, we just spent the last couple of years going after individuals who have either sexually harassed people, sexually assaulted people, and it is um, debilitating and exhausting and hard. And I know that because all of you have probably, you know, been along this ride with me. Um, I think that it is possible to believe somebody um, and to also still see the bigger picture of this being a, a, a problem of a larger systemic issue which is what we've been talking about, which is changing the discord and changing sexual assault and per pervasive sexual assault and harassment in politics so that men can't do that anymore. So that future Joe Biden's future, whoever's um, it's not possible for them to do it. Part of the way we do that once again, repeat the mantra, we get more women in positions of power. That is one of the most fundamentally important, you know, 
reasons why um, the women who run, who ran, the, the unprecedented number of women who ran not only in this presidential election, but in 2018 in the midterms, um, was was sent a message to the world that we were not just there to be objects. So while I honor Tara Reid's story, I can't, per, me personally, I can't um, dwell on it. It's something that is there. It's something that she has shared. I'm not here to debate whether or not it's true. Um, I know how I feel, but I'm also not going to spend energy on a takedown this year. My energy is in looking at down ballot races. My energy is in trying to change the culture. You know, her her experience, her story is so similar to so many other stories um, that is part of a larger picture. And that is the thing I want to fight. That is the thing I want to use all my energy to fight is the big, big, big umbrella of a problem which oversees all the terror reads in the world and all the terror reads in our country. Um, and that is the thing I want to fight from from the from the deep root of it so that we're not just continuing to put band-aids over everything, that we're actually fighting and working to, to end the infection that has been here since the dawn of time. Yeah, thank you so much for that perspective. It's helpful. Okay, I think this is gonna be our last question and I really like this one, so I'm gonna ask this one. Um, who are some of the people that have shaped your perspective or worldview? And of course, you're an artist, you're an activist, you're a director, so authors or strong women, leaders in your life. Who are some of your mentors, role models? Um, so some of my mentors and role models, I would say, first of all, is my fourth grade teacher, Laurel Schmidt. Um, she was my English teacher. Um, she was the one that was really, it really said to me, um, you are not meant to be an actress. You're meant to be a writer. You're ruining your life. <laughs> <laughs> um, she was right. Sort of, not really, um, partially. So I think Laurel, I think having a good teacher in my life, my mom is very much my role model. Um, the author, Audre Lorde, um, Audre Lorde is pretty extraordinary, um, as well as Bell Hooks. I mentioned her earlier. Um, Wanda Coleman, this is a new book that's out actually. Uh, Wanda Coleman was my late mentor. Um, she died several years ago. Brilliant, brilliant poet and was really the one uh, who taught me everything I know about how to write from a place of rage, how to write and be angry, how to channel that anger um, into something deeper. Um, this is a new book I would recommend to anybody called Wicked Enchantment, and it's a collection of a lot of her poems. Um, uh, also, I'm teaching a seminar, if anyone wants to come be a part of it, a workshop on how to harness nice. anger. Yeah, anger, rage, and apathy um, during this particular time into necessary work. So you can go to TuesdayAgency.com if you want to be a part of that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amber. It's been so awesome to have this conversation with you and to hear about your powerful work. Um, before we close tonight, I have a couple of things. Well, one, I wanna give everyone who's been on this call, just thank you so much for joining us, being part of that, for listening, having this conversation. And the, the homework that I mentioned earlier was um, we really asked that, you know, whatever moved you from this event, if there was one thing that, you know, really stood out to you, please share it, share it with a friend or five friends or a family member, or a loved one. Um, that's kind of how we keep this conversation brewing in our community. Um, we also want to say a big thank you to all of our generous sponsors who helped make this possible. I want to thank the entire board and our staff and our volunteers, everybody behind the scenes that did such great work. Um, and again, um, I know there's a lot of wonderful organizations doing such great work at this time, but every dollar really counts. We would be so grateful for your $5, your $500, your $5,000, whatever you can give. So please um, keep supporting us um, and know that we're open during this time. This is a very difficult time and Our Voice continues to support survivors, continues to do this work um, remotely and through telehealth and, in, and also have our offices are open. So please um, just keep spreading the word that we're here and we're supporting and thank you all so much. Yeah, good night. Yeah. Good night. Thanks, Amber. Bye, bye everybody. Bye.